Hi, this is David Abonic Turtle with an illustration of weighted average cost of capital. We call that WAC. The other name for it is marginal cost of capital. At the end, I'll show why it's important to keep in mind this is a marginal cost of capital. And to illustrate, I've got a hypothetical capital structure. You can think about the right-hand side of the balance sheet. Although that's book values, we try to use market values. Although in the case of debt, we oftentimes end up using the book value as a proxy for the market value. But I've got debt, preferred equity, and then equity. And then if I'm, I made some numbers up here, 300 million is the value of the debt. So that might be the book value. But then we're going to just estimate that's the market value, a good proxy for the market value. And then the preferred equity of 100 million and equity of 600 million for a total of 1 billion. And then you can see I can easily calculate the weights. The debt of 300 million is 30% of the uh, total capital structure here of a billion. So I have the weights for each of the three components. Then my weighted average cost of capital, that's just a blended average of the sources of these funds it's the rate of return that's required by the providers of the capital. So in the case of debt, it's lenders that have provided the company capital. In the case of equity, it's shareholders who have provided the capital. So I have a blended average of the components. I already have their weights. I just need each of their respective costs to the company or required rate of return by the respective provider of capital. So I have a cost for debt, preferred, and equity. In the case of debt, that's the interest rate. I'm assuming 8%. Now the one difference with the debt is I need an assumption for the corporate tax rate and that's because the debt provides a tax shield to the company. Interest paid by the company reduces the taxable income, gives the company a tax shield, and makes this debt on an after tax basis cheaper. So we use one minus tax rate to incorporate that tax shield to the company, which lowers, converts the 8% pre-tax into a lower effective after-tax cost to the company. So you can see there a huge benefit um, in terms of debt as a source of financing. And then I have a, just an assumption here for the preferred 10%. So preferred is in between debt and equity. Although economically, it's closer to debt, but notice a key difference here. I'm not going to use the tax rate because the company's not going to get a tax shield for the preferred dividends. And then finally, cost of equity, where it's common practice here, maybe not so modern, maybe certainly not very advanced, but it's common to use the capital asset pricing model. Cost of equity here is risk-free rate plus beta, which is the exposure to the common factor, the market's equity risk premium. So you can see here I've got an assumption about the risk-free rate of 4%. The equity risk premium excess return on the market is 5%. So that means right here, 4 plus 5 means the, we expect the overall market to earn 9%. Then I've got an assumption of beta of 1.6. That's right here. And that means my cost of equity for this company, you can see I've got that formula in here, 4% plus 1.6 beta multiplied by the 5% equity risk premium says to me the required rate of return to my shareholders who invest the equity is 12%. That's my cost of equity. Now you can see if I go back to my weighted average cost of capital as just a blended average, I have weights for each of the three components and I have the ability to calculate their cost and in the case of interest the interest rate it's going to be an effective after tax cost after the tax shield and so I just do that with this formula here the result is 9.6 but you can see I've got the weight of debt 30 percent multiplied by the cost of debt which is eight percent but multiplied by one minus tax rate of 40%, so multiplied by 60%, and that's going to give me the convert the pre-tax 8% to an after-tax cost, recognize the benefit of the tax shield. So right there, I've, I've handled the debt component. Then I go to the preferred. That's more straightforward here. 10% 
weight up here times 10% cost. And finally, I've got the equity component, the 60% weight multiplied by the 12% cost of equity as assumed per the capital asset pricing model. And that tells me my blended average or weighted average is 9.6. And so that's how I calculate the weighted average cost of capital. The final point, I want to go back to that idea that this is a marginal cost of capital. Because if you look at these costs, then you'll notice after tax, um, uh, debt is the cheapest source of funding. And so then perhaps it occurs to you to ask the question, why wouldn't my company simply finance entirely with debt? And to illustrate that, you can see I've got a line here. This line illustrates the weighted average cost of capital based on how much of this capital structure has debt. I've illustrated the example here at 30% debt, which corresponds to this point right here. Don't know if you can see that, but that is that 30% debt here on the x-axis gives us the 9.6% weighted average cost of capital. Now, if I continue to use this model, that's what I've plotted here, and just sub if I swapped out equity and increased the share of debt, in other words, if I leveraged up this company, then this is going to be linear. My weighted average cost of capital, in fact, would go keep going down, down, down. In which case, if I just stuck to this model, since debt has the lowest cost, I would, in fact, go all the way to full leverage if I wanted to minimize the weighted average cost of capital. Yet companies aren't running around 100% leveraged. This model is actually incomplete, and this gets back to the marginal idea, because if, in fact, I did start to leverage, increase the amount of debt, then the cost of financial distress would need to start to enter into the equation, which is to say that, for one thing, my lenders would start to hot charge a higher interest rate. As my leverage gets higher, they're going to boost this up. In fact, all of my providers are going to start to charge a higher rate, and at some point they'd stop financing me if the leverage was too great. And so here's a line that reflects that reality, the cost of financial distress. It's not a direct cost of bankruptcy, but just a, the increased probability of default. And that's illustrated by this line. So we can't, there is such a thing as a theoretical optimal weighted average cost of capital, but it balances on the one hand over here on the left, the fact that equity is expensive with over here on the right, the fact that the greater the leverage, the more we increase the cost of financial distress. And so that goes back to what we put in here was for our current or target capital structure. And the 9.6 really represents an incremental or marginal cost of capital given this structure. As soon as we start to introduce new funds, let's say new debt, increase the leverage of the company, then this actually dynamically starts to change, maybe more up towards here. So it's not like this really operates at all levels. It's a marginal cost of capital. This is David Harper of the Bionic Turtle. Thanks for your time.